when I realize like what makes me happiest and why in trying to bring that to the role that I do is meeting people that are doing really interesting things and pushing the limits, developing those relationships. If I gave you $30 million, how would you turn that into $100 million or whatever? And finding some way to get that real world experience in. You want to associate with that emerging set of companies, not necessarily the companies that were really popular and, and really coming to, to fame. So I think about that and think about just really finding ways to get real world experience with the technology trends around that. In this episode, we are really thrilled to invite Matt as our eighth guest speaker. To give a brief background, currently Matt is the general partner at USVP. Matt hosts a BS in material science and engineering from Purdue University. And after that, he did an MBA and master degree in natural resources and environmental from the University of Michigan. He graduated in 2008. After that, he went to Battery Ventures and participated in the investment areas of software, data analytics, and consumer internet. After that, he joined uh, Salesforce Ventures as the first employee and for eight plus years, he built the global team that became one of the most successful and collaborative investment team in enterprise tech. Most recently, he was a general partner at CRV, where he invests in companies including Power Finance and Insta. We are so excited to kick the story off. It's good to be here. Yeah, so let's the journey start. So Matt, you pursue your uh, undergrad degree with material science and engineering at Purdue University and begin your career as a research. So do you want to actually be an aerospace scientist after uh, undergrad? I did not. So I started a couple of things. I was actually working at uh, Alcoa, which was in, in West Lafayette to help pay for my education. And uh, I was very interested in um, design and creating new products. And so I was excited to go to their R&D facility where um, I did do aerospace design work, which was really interesting, but I was also pursuing the use for in sporting goods, like bicycle frames and, and baseball bats and things like that. So I was, what I didn't realize is I was really interested in launching new products and in, in new markets and in aerospace was one of those. So that, that was what drew me in. Yeah, but then you just trans trans to your MBA, right? Uh, in Ross. So what drives you to your MBA degree? Yeah. So I started to get. I guess there's a combination of things. One was I started to get really interested in sustainability and impact stuff. So I was doing a lot of. I was volunteering in a green building place, and I was really learning about how you bring more sustainable practices into product development. And I started doing some of that while I was working at Alcoa. That was one thing. And then the second thing was I was in this R&D facility and it was also application engineering and the, and the people from the business unit, we talked to the people in the, in the product development group and the research group. And you could tell there was always this mismatch of communication in terms of having the ability to really effectively communicate and figure out what the business and market potential were for a lot of the stuff that we were working on. You have a lot of engineers and scientists who wanted to work on cool stuff. And you had the business people who wanted to make more money and sell stuff. And so that kind of really got me interested in trying to understand how to better bridge the two. And so that's what drew me to Ross, and particularly to the HERB program. It was very unique at the time. It was really, I mean, there were three programs, but it was the only one at the time that had really integrated formally a, a business degree with a sustainability. And so it was between the business school and the school of natural resources and environment and so that's what led me to michigan yeah you identified the opportunity of renewable energy at such an early time you began to pursue that degree really early and i also noticed that you helped to design a un policy in ras do you want to tell that so similar to you one of the things that we did so we had to do a master's thesis and as you've come up with this podcast which gives you the ability an opportunity to talk to a lot of alumni who are in the tech space and in the venture space. We were trying to figure out a way to get deeper into the renewable energy space. So we came up with this program, this master's thesis, where we were looking at the impact of policy, renewable energy policy in, in finance. And how did that explicitly come into like the decision to whether or not to do a project, certain policies? So basically as a way to back in to talk to every renewable energy project developer in every bank 
and the ecosystem, we had this kind of unique access and in, in understanding of how renewable energy projects came together, which was pretty new at the time. Turns out they borrowed a lot of, it's the same thing they, they do in real estate. So just kind of borrow the same tactics. But anyways, we learned a lot and it was a great way to really build out our Rolodex. Actually, I'm also dedicated to renewable energy space and maybe I should also talk to those people in this space and do my own thesis. You actually inspire me. Uh, yeah, so I also noticed that in the summer you were in GE and participated in a renewable leadership program. Mm -hmm. So is that also part of your fellowship or you just accidentally find that opportunity? Yeah, that was a pretty well-worn path. It, it was kind of like one of the more desirable roles that you could get. And it, you know, I was a good candidate because of my engineering background when I'd been in, in manufacturing. It was a pretty highly sought after internship that I was lucky enough to get. Got it. But I'm curious, after our MBA, you just went through Battery Ventures directly, where you did a lot of things about software and data analytics. So what's your transit from renewable to the industry? So, yeah, so I'd say my uh, initial transition into Battery, which is how do you, how do you get into venture? I was there as part of their clean tech group that they had just started to build out like in a couple of years prior. So I kind of right time, right place. I had a bit of a unicorn background in that I had a material science background. I had worked in manufacturing and operations. I was in a design work and then also had worked at GE in their renewable energy group, did a bunch of other things, including the master's thesis. And I had also worked at a venture capital firm while I was in Ann Arbor. And so when you combine all those things, I could tell a pretty good story, even though I had no idea how business really had never worked in a real business doing business stuff, but had a pretty good, you know, compelling background and story in terms of how I thought about technology and markets. And that, that's kind of what you got to do. And we can get into that more. But so I, I was able to develop a pretty unique resume for the role. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Moving after your experience at Battery Ventures, you were the first employees of Salesforce Ventures in the enterprise tech investing. So could you share a little bit about your story in the Salesforce Ventures? So what motivated you to uh, join Salesforce Ventures? Yeah. When I joined Salesforce, I was not at all intending to be an investor. I was. I thought I was leaving the investment world and going more in the operating world. So I started out doing m and had acquired a few businesses in the AI space with the goal of going and working at one of those companies. At the same time, we had been investing somewhat informally and I saw that it was working. And I, I thought that there was an opportunity to thought to build something kind of unique and that I saw that Salesforce had this pretty unique platform that if companies built on the Salesforce platform or they put their application on you know, the Salesforce app store, app exchange, that there was this like great benefit to both Salesforce and the company. And I thought we could actually do something that was helpful for the companies. And, you know, at the time, most of corporate venture was had a very, very bad reputation as being pretty vul vulturistic in that was, was kind of taking advantage of the companies in, in terms of the way they would structure their deals. So, you know, it wasn't a, an obvious decision because you had, you kind of at the time had Google Ventures, now GV. Intel a little bit, but the others were, were did had terrible reputations. And so it was more of a bet that based on what I saw at Salesforce, the growth of SaaS and the Salesforce ecosystem, I did think we could invest and really help these companies in a meaningful way. Turned out that that was true. And the program was much more successful than I ever imagined. I never thought it grew to the scale that it, that it grew to while I was there. So when you found the team in Salesforce Ventures and when you were looking for team members, what kind of qualities are you looking for? What kind of candidates will be like a perfect fit for you? Yeah. So uh, there was a few things I would screen heavily for. One was team players. Um, and everyone says team players, but there was ways that, you know, I would kind of assess that based on their backgrounds. Um, you would look for things like team sports and others. And, and you could just sort of ask people and kind of really... What I found was really helpful just to be very honest about what the requirements, the pros and cons of the role so that when people got in, they weren't surprised was one thing. You know, the other was I would just look for people who had done exceptional things and interesting things. And, and previously, whether that was like being a varsity athlete, which generally takes a lot of discipline or, you know, starting another business or kind of doing something exceptional or interesting and then also people that had a lot of grit and determination and would probe into where they had successes and failures in the past 
and look for those sorts of stories. And really, I would generally dive pretty deep into those because those are pretty telling about and, and pretty good indicators about someone's character and their and their future trajectory. Yeah, a follow up question on that is when you were hiring young people, for example, new grad, they don't have a lot of working experience. How do you evaluate their characteristics without working with them or kind of like yeah. background check? No, we, we didn't we hire that many new grads, but even the new grads that we did hire, I mean, we, we did hire one that was pretty young. Mm-hmm. And I remember that this guy, he was from India and he, he had really done a nice job of convincing a venture firm to hire him. He was there kind of on a six month internship when you could talk to people who had talked to him, you know, he was always finding kind of. I would say entrepreneurial ways to to get stuff done. And so it's kind of really probing into those things. You don't necessarily just have to look at their professional background and their CV. He was actually, now that I recall, he was a, a junior Olympic javelin thrower, right? And he wasn't a particularly like gifted athlete. And you talk to him about that and how he got there and why he did it. And it just showed a lot of discipline and thoughtfulness. And so you could just kind of see these same sorts of patterns, whether you could look for people that started businesses in their while they're in high school or, or in college and things like that, you, you generally can kind of find a bit of a trend. People's personalities tend to be reasonably consistent. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that totally makes sense. And I know a lot of companies that you have invested in, like DocuSign, Snowflake, Zoom, they have gone public. So how did you find out those opportunities to invest in those firms before they go public, even in the early stage? And I know you also mentioned your preference of investing data first. Could you elaborate more on that? I'll break that up into two parts. So, you know, the fortunate thing is if you were investing in SaaS starting in 2014, it wasn't a particularly sexy area to be investing in. And so you could kind of find a company that was taking something that was done manually and someone was doing it digitally or taking something that was done in an on software solution. And that was the formation of Salesforce, right? There was Oracle SQL systems, which had a Salesforce automation CRM solution, your database with all your sales contacts, your customer contacts, but it was just a terrible, horrible experience. And it was really expensive and slow. And when SaaS came along and Salesforce started to prove out that model, you could just kind of go down the road and look for each business that was doing something to kind of modernize it. And so I would say it was, you know, a lot more straightforward then when the category, so it's always good to be early to a category. So it was different then. And so I'd say, as you're asking me about data and what's happening is I'd say, if you kind of play what play out, what did happen over the last decade was now, if you look at a, someone in sales, they have like six, seven, eight apps that they're paying for. If you look at someone in HR or any any job function, there's now a sprawl of, of applications that they're using. And so what has changed is, and if you looked at the what we were investing in, typically we were looking at something that was like the core system of record, you know, like your CRM database or your core system of work. Think of Canva, all your collaborate, all your creative work was being done there. And so as you kind of move that forward, what's happening now is people are tired of paying for all these apps that they're using. They're, they're not getting the productivity gains that they hope for. And, and so with the advent of more of the modern data, data stack, like around the cloud data warehouse companies like Snowflake, what happens is companies are just kind of, they want to see this unified view of all their data. So they're sucking in all that data from all these applications. They're putting it in Snowflake and they're doing all sorts of analyses on top of it. And what you're starting to see emerge, particularly with the advent of AI is now, while everyone's invested all this time, energy, and money into getting all their data and putting it into cloud data warehouse and transforming it. So you have these beautiful tables where you can run analyses. So now you're going to start, I think, with AI is really advancing to build bigger and bigger apps that kind of this trend of what I'm calling like the rebundling of SaaS applications. So if you're familiar with a company like Rippling, they're building this big, massive next-gen HR platform for small businesses that has like all the functionalities built into it. And so people using them for all sorts of different modules. And I think that's sort of the trend that this is AI and, and the new, more modern data infrastructure is going to allow. So it's super exciting because I think you're going to see these really, really big companies emerge both in horizontal applications like sales and marketing and, and HR but also in in vertical applications where in architecture, you can combine design, mechanical engineering and drawings and permitting and things like that. So 
think it's going to kind of resh reshuffle the locations. Mm -hmm. I wonder in which stage did you invest in those companies? And especially given you were working in Salesforce, it's kind of like a CVC environment. You have to make sure there's some synergies with the parent company. Yeah. Do you think there's any limitations of investing in this way? As a strategic investor? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I think there are. I mean, I think there's always limitations, right? And I think limitations are, are good uh, and enforces a bit of discipline. I mean, I... I work at a $400 million fund right now, and I can't write a $100 million check into a business. So I certainly have limitations. At Salesforce, the way that we thought about it, at least the way I thought about it was, why I think Salesforce was positioned to be successful is that they did have this platform. And so if a company that we wanted to invest in or a startup wanted to integrate with Salesforce's product, and that combined integration was gonna make our customer, that is Salesforce's customer, and the startup's customer more successful, that was great. That was a great win for the customer. It was a great win for Salesforce, and it was a win for the startup that we were working with. And that was the generally kind of the simple model that we used. And, you know, how that would actually manifest in practice is we would generally not invest in stuff if we were going to compete with them in the near term or if it was kind of too close to what we were doing. And then we didn't also want to invest in stuff that was like too far out, that was too unrelated to the Salesforce ecosystem, but as Salesforce expanded and added more product applications and did more acquisitions that what we would invest in continue to expand pretty significantly. But that was the guiding light was, and that why, that's why it was an easy sell to founders and startups to work with us and, and take Salesforce money. That's great. I think we talked a lot about Salesforce and that's all really insightful. So leaving Salesforce, you transitioned to CRV two years ago, and now you are the GP of USVPs. So what's your focus now? And how how, how are the things different than before? Yeah. Well, that's, you know, it kind of laid out a lot of that thesis that I'm investing in is that extension of whatever iteration you want to say we're on in SaaS, but it's the old playbook of finding something that's kind of analog or on pen and paper and, and committing it to SaaS applications is kind of done. So I think it's layering in that rebundling of applications, layering in more intelligence, layering in more automation. And that's where you'll have opportunities to potentially even someday disrupt companies like Salesforce, which is a fantastic company and great product. But it's really hard for the sales product to talk to the customer success product, to talk to their customer service product, et cetera. And so I think because these have largely come about through acquisitions and they have different databases and the products just quite don't talk to one another that well. So I think there will be opportunities to come in and disrupt a lot of the incumbent players, as I was saying, or even in, in vertical SaaS applications, particularly now as not only as you layer these, these SaaS applications, what I'm seeing happen now in verticals, even if you look at companies like Instill, which had previously invested into CRV in the nonprofit space, right? It's if you're selling a vertical SaaS application, you not only have to have like the database, but you have to have like the email marketing, and then you have to have signups and you have to have analytics and you have to have all these things that historically required them to buy a point solution for each one. Now with uh, common data infrastructure, the more yeah. modern data infrastructure, you can build that whole application on one database, and then you're going to start to be able to build automations. And, and I'd say the other thing in vertical SaaS that's pretty interesting is you're also laying in financial services. A lot of times you have payments where you sign up for an event, you collect payment and you get money off of that, or you're in some vertical where you're, you're doing payroll or something like that. You can start offering financial products to those employees as well. And there's other areas I'm still really seeing a lot of interesting things in the developer world where companies are taking, abstracting away capabilities and bundling them up in an API and developers are now using those to power a lot of their application. It's what we did it when we invested in Twilio, that if you were building an application and you wanted to have SMS capability, you, you bundled that in, but you're seeing that continue to take off on a whole bunch of functionality within modern SaaS apps. So Lots of innovation, lots of new and interesting stuff. So spending a lot of time in that combination of AI, modern data, and sort of developer-facing solutions. 
Mm -hmm. What could you share more about the investment thesis for US VPs? And you just mentioned AI. How does AI fit into your investment strategy? Yeah. So US VPs, the early stage fund. So typically we're investing in companies that have um, a product in market. And that generally means they have some revenue. We're coming in after the really first early stage seed investors will come in as they refer to as the series A. I don't know how well your, your audience is versed in venture capital, but that's kind of generally the first largest institutional round. So within that, we invest about a third of our fund invests in healthcare, which is kind of therapeutics and devices. And two thirds of the fund is, is uh, information technology. So it's kind of split up between cyber, SaaS, enterprise stuff that I focus on. And also we do some consumer in terms of AI, we're spending a lot of time here. You know, I was talking to one of my partners uh, earlier this week and mm -hmm. we have in the healthcare uh, arena, we, we have two or three companies that are like really pushing the limits and doing some really cool stuff in the AI space. Um, for instance, we have one that STS surgical technology solutions that uses AI in, in com combination with video in, in an operating room to look and see and monitor what surgeons are doing, making sure that people are following best practices and seeing that where are areas for improvement. We didn't invest in that because it was like an AI company. It was because we saw the value of what they're doing. And we have a number of our healthcare companies that are doing that, a number of our cybersecurity companies that are doing that. So we're kind of looking at the value proposition and the problem that they're solving, because I do think it's a bit frothy right now. And there's a lot of people who are taking AI and are going to get commoditized very quickly by open AI and by other solutions. And we're spending a tremendous amount of time and think it's going to be revolutionary too. We're going to be using it every day, all the time, but also being careful about how and where we invest, because I do think a lot of the money that's been poured in, will have a hard time returning capital to investors. So I think we'll move to the next part. We are actually seeking some of your advice since you are a person who had over 15 years experience mm -hmm. in venture capital. So what will we talk to those young people who actually want to break the, into this area after they graduate? Yeah, it's an easy topic, but such a hard topic. I would yeah. say that I had a very non-obvious path in, but if you look at kind of the key thing and why I think I got in, well, there's a lot of luck involved for sure, but it was sort of this in uh, a bit of right time, right place. Like it wasn't clear when I was moving in that that clean tech and having a manufacturing background and all this stuff was going to lead you to, it, it seemed like a horrible uh, background to get into to venture capital. Like if you'd have gone five years prior, right? And so a lot of it is some of timing and pursuing what's interesting to you. And so if you had been focused on AI 10 years ago, you could get lots of jobs. Um, if you were focusing five years ago, it wasn't as interesting. You know, one or two years ago, it started to become really, like in the last year, it started to become really interesting again, um, and particularly around transformers. But so I, what I would say is, you know, that more than anything, you just need to follow your pursuits and find things that are interesting to you and try and become really unique and really interesting and in, in, in differentiated in those areas because it's going to sustain you. You'll do good work and, and it's kind of hard to time what the trends are going to be in venture capital. I would say that's more of the philosophical. There's not that many jobs. And so you kind of have to think of it that way. More of the tactical is, you know, there's a lot of things that you can do. And I always sort of back up and say, you kind of have to imagine yourself in the interview and the question that they're sort of asking you that they don't generally ask you is like, if I gave you $30 million, how would you turn that into a hundred million dollars or whatever? And, and so then that comes down to a series of like, well, you know, where do you have expertise? Where do you have a network where you can, you know, really source good investments? And so I would say the best way to do that is it's great to read blogs and take courses and things like that, but you really got to get involved. You want to get involved in startups. You want to get involved in Try and find ways to network with people at some of these aspirational companies that are really transforming the technological landscape currently. And, and so I think really it's that finding some ways to get that real world experience in. You want to associate with that emerging set of companies, not necessarily the companies that were really popular and, and really coming to, to fame 10 years ago, you want the ones that, you know, have been gone public in the last two, three, four years, or are going to be public in the next two or three years. So I think about that and think about just really finding ways to get real world experience with the technology trends around those. I'm really curious that, did you have any good mentors when you were really young? And even now, 
when you feel like you have to talk to somebody to ask for help, who yeah. would you talk to? I've had some pretty good mentors. I mean, my last boss at Salesforce, John Smorge, I was a very good mentor. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I'd worked for him for, for about the whole time I was at Salesforce. But I think in addition to that, the, the one that I, the one piece of advice that I wish someone had given me a long time before was, we'll get to this too, but there's a podcast founders. And what this guy does is he reviews biographies. And I think you'll be amazed at how much you can learn and how much a book can be a mentor. I would say seek out mentors. That is, you know, you, it's hard to replace that. But in addition to that, I would read biographies and continuously read, read, read and get smarter. And because you, you see the same lessons coming over and over. And it's amazing how much you can actually learn as though you're talking to talking to that person by reading one or two of their biographies. And you really can take away a lot of those lessons. Yeah, I have some mentors that I never met before. I read their blogs, I watch their videos. I feel like sometimes I don't really need to talk to them. I just learned yeah. so much from their publications and lectures that they teach to other students. Yeah. Actually, uh, when I look at your background, like on website, there is a very interesting description that you travel so much. You went to Tanzania and you do a lot of adventures and yeah. it's recognized that your life value is all about venture, curiosity, and relationship building. So I'm, I'm, ask, I'm very curious, do you want to talk about your life value? Yeah, I think that, you know, as I've gotten older, I've really thought a lot about my kind of mission and purpose and what drives me and got to this through lots of reflection, journaling, and things like that. And it really is this, when I realize like what makes me happiest and why, and trying to bring that to the role that I do, it's meeting people that are doing really interesting things and pushing the limits, developing those relationships. And then if you think about what a startup is and kind of the role, if how I take the role, I think other people take investor roles, board roles differently, but you're not really a Sherpa because you're not like doing the hard work for them, but you're kind of like along the ride with them on an adventure. And to the extent that you can enjoy both the ups and the downs, or at least be there in the downs and when stuff sucks, try and make them suck less for the founder. And, and, and it really, you're able to do that if you develop that trust, if you um, have a great relationship and you're really kind of along for that long journey. And so many of my investments, even if maybe not financially successful have you've developed these amazing relationships that in the end have proven successful in other ways whether it's referring other investments or investing in them again and so to me that's what drives me and that's what motivates me and that's what excites me because i kind of think you have to associate yourself with something broader than the near term outcome of your of your if you get this investment done or if not but what's really going to bring satisfaction and joy on a, you know, daily, weekly, and monthly basis. And if you can really focus on that in the process, then good things should come over time. And so it's really been that really defining for myself, what, what motivates me, what drives me and what's, what's my mission. Yeah, that's really inspiring. And at last we have a rapid fire for you All right. questions and yeah. So do you want to start? Yeah, for sure. So the first rapid fire question is, what is your favorite place in U of M? It was, and this tends to be what I would say about every city I've ever been in, there was the trail that went along the reservoir north of the city that was, I forget the park. I cannot remember the name of the park, but I would go for runs there all the time. And I always find like these parks where I can get away from everything and go for a run consistent with what you'll see. And and that, that was my favorite thing about U of M. And I, I didn't see that question ahead of time. So that was, that was definitely a uh, top of mind. First thing that came up. Second question is what's your favorite book? My favorite book. Mm-hmm. So that changes a lot. Uh, and it kind of depends on the place I'm in. I could say right now, the book I'm reading that is really influencing me is Clear Thinking by Shane Parrish. And I think it's just a really, really thoughtful and interesting way to put a framework around how to become a better thinker and decision maker. Gotcha. And the last one is what's your favorite podcast? Well, so my, my MPOD, no, my favorite pod, Strike Force 5, but that's aside from the point, I would say I narrowed it down to three that are, that I listen to that are VC and business related. And that would be Founders, which I mentioned, 
the choir yeah. and and then the knowledge project which is the guy the author i just referenced shane paris is the author that's his podcast yeah those are all the names that have been mentioned all the time yeah <laughs> all right that's all of our questions for today thank you so much all right man. sure nice meeting you and fun yeah. to do it thank you thank you all right